The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. You're listening to Horror Old Time Radio. The Turn of the Screw is a dramatization by Neville Taylor of Henry James' classic novel of horror and possession. When a new young governess arrives at Blythe, a remote country house in Essex, she fears that her two young charges, Miles and Flora, may be hiding a dark secret. As the days go by, she witnesses some strange visions, which lead her to the conclusion that the house, and the children, are possessed by evil forces. The Turn of the Screw by Henry James Dramatised for radio by Neville Teller Yes, quite satisfyingly gruesome, Griffin. A good effort. And every word, the gospel truth. Now, that I don't believe. I give it beta plus for horror, but omega for veracity. (laughs) Nevertheless... An excellent ghost story for a Christmas Eve. Thank you, Douglas. Mm. I did my best to chill you to the marrow. <laughs> Rather difficult to achieve in front of a roaring fire. Yeah, of course. What made your tale peculiarly horrible was the involvement of the little boy. Mm. But if the presence of one child gives an extra turn of the screw, so to speak, what would you say to two children? That it would give... Two turns, of course. (laughs) And, Douglas, that I'd want to hear all about it. Well, as your host, I suppose I'm under an obligation to keep my house guest entertained. (laughs) Though I must admit, the events I have in mind are far from entertaining. Quite the reverse. It was all too horrible. Beyond everything. It outdoes your tale tenfold. Nothing I know even touches it. For sheer... Terror? For sheer dreadfulness. Well? Douglas? Hmm? Oh, yes. Um, I, I have in my desk here... Uh, excuse me. Uh, lock in the drawer. Manuscript. Ah. Uh, a most beautiful hand. See? A woman's. She's been dead these 20 years... I first met her here, in this house. I was in my second year at Oxford, and when I came down in the long vac, I found that she'd been engaged as a governess for my sister. Oh, but she was such a charming person. I was ten years younger than she was, but she seemed to find it easy to talk to me. Don't grin like that, Griffin. Yes, I liked her very much indeed. But if I hadn't, I doubt if she'd ever have told me about those dreadful... Those terrible events. She'd never told anybody else. And the manuscript? How did you come by that? Oh, I asked her to write it later. Some years later. And she agreed. I thought the facts ought to be set down. Well, let's hear them. All in good time. First I must sketch in the background or nothing will make any sense. Uh, We must go back more than 50 years... My friend was then just 20, the youngest daughter of a country parson. Under the necessity of earning a living, she had responded to an advertisement for a governess and had been required to attend for interview in London. She'd never been in London before, and she found herself outside a house in Harley Street that impressed her as vast and imposing. Soon she was seated before a gentleman, a bachelor in the prime of life, a figure such as she had only ever experienced in dreams or in the pages of novels. Handsome, bold, rich, pleasant, kind. I should be so very much in your debt. I've done all I can for those two poor little souls. Yeah, I assure you, I do take my responsibilities as their guardian most seriously. But they require the sort of care and attention that I personally could never provide. Have they recovered from the shock of their parents' death? Oh, I think so. Children are so resilient, aren't they? (laughs) But to be perfectly frank with you, I'm not sure that I have, quite. I was very close to my brother, and he and his wife died in India in most tragic circumstances. I won't burden you with the details. And where are the children? Above in the nursery? Oh, they're not here. The family seat is in Essex. 
and it seemed much more suitable for the children to live there than in town. Don't you agree? Oh, I do. Well, that's where I trust you'll take charge of them for me. But who's looking after them at present? Well, at the moment, the little boy, Miles, is away at school. He's only just ten, and I wouldn't have chosen to send him away, but unfortunately, the young lady whom I'd engaged to care for the children's education died quite suddenly, and oh. I had no alternative. Flora, his little sister, is being cared for by the housekeeper, Mrs Gross. Well, of course, Bly also has the usual staff, cook, housemaid, dairy woman, gardener, and so forth, but... As governess, you would be in supreme authority. You'd be in loco parentis. Oh, that's rather a daunting prospect. <laughs> oh, please, don't be daunted, I beg you. The children are both delightful. They won't be a bother to you. You'll adore Flora on sight, and Miles is a pleasure to be with. He'll be back at Bly shortly for the school holidays. You'll find the house very comfortable, and the grounds are extensive. I'm sure you'll be very satisfied with life at Bly. And you would be doing me such a personal favour. In that case, I can scarcely refuse. Good. You'll not regret your decision, I'm sure. But there is just one thing that I must ask of you. I do hope you'll be able to grant it. I'll do my best. What is it you want? For you to take over at Bly completely and to consult me about nothing. Nothing at all. Money will be sent to you regularly by my solicitors. Use it as you see fit, but please do not communicate with me. In short, I want you to take complete charge and to give me peace of mind about the children. I know I'm asking a great deal of you, but will you do this for me? I will. She told me that when, for a moment, disburdened, delighted, he held her hand to thank her, she already felt rewarded. But was that all her reward? She never saw him again. Good gracious. That, in itself, is, is odd. You'll learn why. Shall I start reading the manuscript? Yes. Get on with it. Very well. <clears throat> She starts. I remember the whole beginning as a succession of flights and drops. The mood of optimism, optimism. indeed, indeed near, near exaltation in which I'd agreed to take on the position, soon faded. And on the journey to Bly, I spent the long hours of bumping, swinging coach full of doubts. At the stopping place, I was met by a vehicle from the house, and it was late in the afternoon of a glorious June day that we turned into the drive at Bly. And there stood the house, a magnificent edifice flanked by two crenellated towers. There immediately appeared at the door a civil person holding a little girl by the hand. And she dropped me as decent a curtsy as if I'd been mistress of the place. Welcome to Bly, miss. Welcome indeed. We've been looking out for you all afternoon. Good afternoon. You must be Mrs Gross. Mm. And you. You're Flora. How do you do? I hope you had a pleasant journey. Well, Flora, it was very long and tiring, and I'm certainly pleased to be here at last. Oh, miss, you must be yearning for a cup of tea. Do please follow me. I alerted Cook as soon as we spied your carriage. Then I'll show you to your room and you'll be able to rest and freshen yourself before dinner. Oh, Mrs Gross? Oh, may I? Oh, come in, Miss, do. Miss Flora all tucked up for the night. Oh, and asleep already. Oh, what an adorable child she is. And so lovely. I don't think I've ever seen a more beautiful little girl. Oh, well, she's certainly that, miss. And the little boy, Miles, does he look like her? Is he too so very remarkable? Most remarkable, miss. If you think well of her, you'll be quite carried away by the little gentleman. Oh, I'm afraid I'm rather easily carried away. I was carried away in London. In Harley Street? Indeed. Well, miss, you're not the first... And you won't be the last. Oh, oh, I've no pretensions to being the only one. A pack 
packet has just arrived in the post bag for you, Miss. It's from the master. Thank you, Mrs. Gross. Oh, uh, please, wait a moment. This may contain instructions that concern us both. I enclose an unopened letter which I recognise as from the headmaster. And the headmaster's an awful bore. Read him, please. Deal with him. But tell me nothing of the matter. Not a word. Good gracious. What does it mean? The child's been dismissed from his school. Master Miles? But aren't they all sent home? Yes, for the holidays. Miles is not to return. The headmaster won't allow him back. But what has he done? It doesn't actually say. I regret that it will be impossible to keep him. It can only mean that Miles is an injury to the others. Master Miles, an injury? He's scarcely ten years old. So you've never known him bad? Oh, I don't pretend that, miss. Thank God. You mean that a boy without spirit... Is no boy for me. Nor me. But not to the degree to contaminate. To corrupt. Tell me, Mrs Gross, the lady who was here before, what was she like? The last governess. Hmm. She was also young and pretty. You. Almost as young and pretty as you, miss. Indeed. He seems to like us young and pretty. Oh, he did. I mean, uh, that's his way, the master's. But who were you speaking of at first? Why, the master, of course. Who else? And what happened to her? Did she die here? No, she went off. She was taken ill, you mean, and went home? No, she left at the end of the year for a short holiday and never returned. I was expecting her back when I heard from the master she was dead. But of what? He never told me. The next day, I went with the carriage to collect Miles from the inn at which the coach had put him down. The moment I set eyes on him, I felt, exactly as with his little sister, that I was seeing him in a great glow of freshness and purity, outside and in. It's grotesque, Mrs. Gross. Grotesque! You have only to look at the boy. He's innocence itself. Too good, I dare say, for the horrid, unclean world of the boarding school. So what will you do about the letter? Nothing. I shall do nothing at all. But... And so we settled into an agreeable way of life. The attraction of my small charges was a constant joy. The best way to picture it all is to say that I was dazzled by the purity and innocence of the children, and that I was off my guard. One evening at the end of a long June day, with the children tucked up in bed, I'd come out, as so often, for a stroll. On these evening walks of mine, I'd often played with the idea, as in a story, of unexpectedly encountering a handsome and charming stranger. That evening, coming suddenly into view of the house, it seemed as if my imagination had, in a flash, turned real. He did stand there, but high up, at the very top of one of the two crenellated towers that flanked the house. But this figure, in the clear twilight, wasn't the person I'd initially supposed. It was a man I'd never seen before, in Harley Street or anywhere else. While I took it in, the sounds of evening fell into an intense hush. The man who looked at me over the battlements was as definite as a picture in a frame. I thought with extraordinary quickness of each person he might have been, and wasn't. We were too far apart to call to each other, but after a moment, never taking his eyes from me, he slowly walked to the opposite corner of the platform. Here he stopped, and still fixing me with his gaze, turned away. That was all that I knew. Was all I knew. A mysterious figure on top of a tower. How very gothic. Yeah, exactly. And she was racked by curiosity and dread. Was there a secret at Bly? A mystery of Udolfo? An insane, an unmentionable relative kept in unsuspected confinement? And was there? <laughs> Patience, Griffin. Patience. Meanwhile, perhaps to spare Mrs. Gross, the governess said nothing of her encounter but day after day tried to puzzle out the truth. 
she could arrive at no satisfactory explanation. The horrific truth was revealed one Sunday evening, a few weeks later. It had rained so persistently that day that there was no question of going to church in the morning. But during the afternoon, the rain eased. I'll be with you in a moment, Mrs. Gross. Don't hurry yourself, miss. We've plenty of time before even song. It's my gloves. I left them in the dining room. The day had been grey and wet, but there was sufficient light as I crossed the threshold for me to see the articles I wanted on a chair by the tall windows. At the same instant, I became aware of a person on the other side of the window looking straight in. One step into the room sufficed. This was the person who'd already appeared to me, but this time with a nearness that made me catch my breath. And this time something happened that hadn't happened before. His deep, hard stare quitted my face for a moment, and he looked around the room. On the spot, there came to me the shock of knowing, without a doubt, that it wasn't for me he had come. He'd come for someone else. Mrs. Gross! Mrs. Gross! Quickly! Mrs. Gross! I'm coming! I'm coming! Oh, Mrs. Gross! Whatever's the matter, miss? You're as white as a sheet. Oh, Mrs. Gross, just now through this window. What was it? An extraordinary man looking in. He's gone. Have you seen him before? Once, on the old tower. You didn't tell me. No, I, I wasn't. I wanted. I, I should have. I, I've been dying to tell you. What's he like? He has no hat. Red hair, close curling, a long, pale face and arched eyebrows. Certainly not a gentleman. A gentleman? Never. You know him, then? How is he dressed? In somebody's clothes. They're smart, but they're not his own. They're the masters. You do know him? Quint. Peter Quint. The master's valet when he was here. When the master was? He never wore a hat, but he did wear... <sighs> Well, there were waistcoats missing. They were both here last year. Then the master went, and Quint was alone with us, in charge. And what became of him? He died. Died? Yes. Mr Quint's dead. You say he was looking for someone else. He was looking for little Miles. That's who he was looking for. But how do you know? I know. I know. And you know, my dear. He wants to appear to the children. But why? Oh, I wonder. You know, it's odd. But my pupils have never mentioned the time they were with him. Never even mentioned his name. And you tell me they were great friends. Oh, it wasn't Miles. It was Quint's own fancy. Quint was much too free. Too free? With my boy? For several months, they were inseparable. They spent hours together. I didn't like it. We talked late into that Sunday night, and I learned a good deal about the months Peter Quint had passed at Bly. An evil time that ended one winter's morning when he was found dead on the road from the village. A fatal wound to his head was later determined to have been produced by a slip in the dark on a steep, icy slope. And yet, free with information though Mrs. Gross had been, I remained haunted by the shadow of something she hadn't told me, something she'd kept back. That something was about to be revealed to me in all its horror. On Tuesday afternoon, I took Flora for a walk in the grounds. Miles wished to finish a book he was reading, and we left him indoors. The day was exceptionally warm, and we made our way to the edge of the lake, where I took up my stitching. I'd become fully engaged in my work, when I suddenly became aware that on the other side of the lake there was... an alien object, a spectator... I can feel once more the spasm of my effort not to look over. What I did was to transfer my gaze to little Flora. In that very instant, she turned her back to the water, picked up a flat piece of wood that happened to have a hole in it, and with the idea, perhaps, of producing a mast, was intently tightening a twig into the hole. 
I waited some seconds, and then I felt ready to face what I had to face. They know. Oh, Mrs. Gross, it's too monstrous. They know. And what on earth? Why, all that we know. Oh, and heaven knows what more besides. Two hours ago in the grounds, Flora saw. She told you? Not a word. That's the horror. She kept it to herself, a child of eight. Then how do you know? I was there. I saw with my own eyes. She was perfectly aware. Of him? Of her. Her? Another person, but of quite as unmistakable horror. And evil, a woman in black, pale, dreadful, on the other side of the lake. I was there with the child. Have you seen her before? Never, but the child has. You have. My predecessor, the one who died. Miss Jessel? But how can you be sure? Ask Flora. She's sure. Oh, no, for God's sake, don't. She'll lie. How can you? Because I'm quite clear. Flora doesn't want me to know. But the child must be protected from that woman, from what she wants. Well, what does she want? To get hold of her. Oh, dear Lord. This person, she was in black, you say? In mourning. Extraordinarily beautiful, but infamous. Miss Jessel was infamous. They both were. But she was a lady, and he, he came from the gutter. He did whatever he wished. With her? With all of them. And what did she die of? I never knew. I didn't want to know. I imagined, and I still imagine. And what I imagine is dreadful. Over and over in the small hours, I could repeat to Mrs. Gross that with the children's voices in one's ears, their fragrant faces against one's cheek, nothing mattered but their vulnerability and their beauty. And yet, as we spoke, hints of something less than total innocence forced themselves on me. And I didn't like Miles spending so much time with Peter Quint. I spoke to Miss Jessel about it. She told me to mind my own business. Did you speak to Miles? He wouldn't speak of it. He never mentioned anything that passed between him and Quint. And Miss Jessel, did he speak of her? Never. Never. But you could see that he knew what was between the two wretches, that he was covering and concealing it. Oh, he couldn't prevent. You're learning the truth, I dare say. But heavens, see what they succeeded in making of him. Oh, now that letter from his school seems less incomprehensible. Well, if he was such a fiend at school, how is he such an angel now? Yes, indeed. Ask me that again one day. I waited and waited. Stranger than I can express was the effort to struggle against my new insights. But both children were at this period extravagantly fond of me. They'd never wanted to do so many things for their, for their poor, poor protectress. protectress. Yes, well, clearly Miles wasn't the little innocent she imagined him to be. In fact, Douglas, it seems clear to me that the woman's imagination ran riot. Why? Do you believe she didn't see Quint and Miss Jessel? Well, we have only her own word for both encounters. Perhaps, Griffin, perhaps. Here, your glass is empty. Let me give you a refill. Uh, thank you. So, there's more to come? Oh, a great deal more. I'm quite interested in these apparitions. Did the governess see them again? Several times. You know she shared a room with Flora. Well, one evening, she hadn't gone to bed, but sat reading by the light of a candle. Suddenly, she had the feeling of something... A stir in the house. She took her candle, went out and locked the door, and walked down the passage till she came in sight of the tall window at the turn of the staircase. At that instant, unaccountably, her candle went out, and in the moonlight she saw a figure walking up the stairs. It had reached the landing halfway up. The light from the window was quite sufficient for her to recognise 
quint. When it saw her, it stopped and stared long and hard at her. She felt he knew her as well as she knew him. After a long, intense moment, she saw the figure turn and pass straight down the staircase into the darkness. Inside the house, the figure had come indoors. The horror's getting closer. But there was an even greater shock awaiting her when she got back to the room. She found Flora's bed empty and the child up and gazing through the window. She questioned the child closely, but the little girl maintained she'd awoken, found the governess not in the room, and had looked out to see if she had gone for a walk. You were looking for me out of the window. You thought I might be walking in the grounds. Well, you know, I thought someone was. And did you see anyone? Oh, no, of course not. If you weren't out there, who could be? One evening, I went to bed in the room I shared with little Flora and slept till about one o'clock. When I woke, it was to sit straight up as completely roused as if a hand had shaken me. I'd left a light burning, but it was now out, and I felt an instant certainty that Flora had extinguished it. I climbed out and went straight in the darkness to her bed. She wasn't in it. A glance at the window enlightened me. The child had squeezed in behind the blind and was again peering out into the night. She was, I was certain, face to face with the apparition we had met at the lake. Her concentration was so intense that nothing I did disturbed her. I slipped into a wrap and slippers and quickly made my way out into the corridor and down one flight of stairs to a room on the flank of the house, beneath the tower. I went over to the window and looked out. On the lawn stood a person, motionless, and as if fascinated, looking up at something above me. There was clearly another person above me on the tower, but the presence on the lawn wasn't in the least what I had conceived. It was poor little Miles. Of course I rushed down to bring him in. What did he do? As soon as I appeared on the terrace, he came across to me. I took his hand, without a word, and led him back to his room. Miles, you must tell me now, and all the truth. What did you go out for? What were you doing there? Just so that you should do this. Do what? Think me for a change bad. <laughs> I see you didn't undress at all. No, I sat up in bed and read. At midnight, I went out. When I'm bad, I'm bad. I see. But how could you be sure that I'd know? Oh, I arranged that with Flora. But she was to get up and look out. That would disturb you. To see what she was looking at, you'd also look out and see, which you did. it doesn't add up, Mrs. Gross, does it? I awoke by chance, not by Flora's design. No. No, the four, Quint, Miss Chessel, Miles and little Flora, perpetually meet. Oh. Depend upon it. If there were nothing else, the systematic silence of the children would be proof enough. But... Oh, yes. We may sit here and look at them. But even while they pretend to be lost in their fairy tale, they're steeped in their vision of the dead restored to them. Heaven help us. They're not mine. They're not ours. They're his and they're hers. Quint and that woman want to get to them. But for what? For the love of all the evil the pair put into them. To destroy them, of course. <laughs> Look here, my dear. When in the world am I going back to school? Were you very happy at school? Oh, I'm happy enough anywhere. Well, then, if you're as happy here... Ah, but that isn't everything. I want to see more life. I want my own sort. Does my uncle think what you think? How do you know what I think? Ah, 
Well, of course I don't, my dear. You never tell me. But, I mean, does he know the way I'm going on? <laughs> I don't think your uncle much cares. Then don't you think he could be made to? How? Why? By guessing him to come down here. But who'll get him to do that? I will. I could not follow them into church. Thinking hard, I came out of the churchyard. By the time I reached the house, I'd made up my mind. I would leave Bly, and at once. The house was deserted. This was my opportunity. I made my way up to the schoolroom, where there were objects belonging to me that I should have to take. I opened the door, and in a flash I found again my eyes unsealed. Seated at my own table in the clear noonday light was my vile predecessor. As I stared, she rose, dark as midnight in her black dress, her haggard beauty and her unutterable woe. She looked at me, and I had the extraordinary chill of a feeling that it was I who was the intruder. The next minute there was nothing in the room but the sunshine, and the sense that I must stay. It's all out, Mrs. Grocer. Between Miles and me, it's all out. What's all out, miss? It doesn't matter. Do you know why I miss church, my dear? I came home for a talk with Miss Jessel. A talk? Do you mean she spoke? It came to that. I found her in the schoolroom. And what did she say? That she suffers the torments of the damned. And that's why, to share them, she wants Flora. Oh. But it doesn't matter. I've made up my mind. To what? To sending for their uncle. If Miles thinks I'm afraid to, he'll find that he's mistaken. I'll show his uncle the headmaster's letter. I'll make it clear that I can't undertake to intervene on behalf of a child who's been expelled. We've never in the least known what for. For wickedness. What else? When he's so clever and beautiful and perfect, there can be no other explanation. And after all, it's their uncle's fault. He left those people here with the children. Quint, Miss Jessel, he carries a burden of guilt for the consequences. I'll write tonight. I say, you there, outside my door, come in. How did you know I was there? I heard you, of course. Then you weren't asleep. Not much. I lie awake and think. And what do you think of, Miles? What in the world, my dear? But you? And this strange business of ours. What strange business, Miles? Why, the way you bring me up. And all the rest. You shall certainly go back to school, Miles, if that's what's troubling you. But not to the old place. We must find a better one. Do you know, Miles, you've never said a word to me about your school. Never mentioned it in any way. Haven't I? <laughs> not a word. Naturally, I assumed that you were perfectly content with your present life. I'm not. I'm not. I want to get away. My uncle must come down, and you must completely settle things. You'll have to tell him about the way you've let it all drop. You'll have to tell him a tremendous lot. And how much, Miles, will you have to tell him? There are things he'll ask you. What things? The things you've never told me. Oh, Miles. Dear Miles. Oh, is there nothing, nothing at all, that you want to tell me? I'd like you to leave me alone. Very well. Before I go, Miles, tell me, what happened before? Before what? Before you came back to Bly, and before you went away to school in the first place. What happened? I caught for the very first time a small, faint quaver of consent. It made me drop on my knees beside the bed and seize once more the chance of possessing him. Oh. Dear little Miles, dear little Miles, if you knew how much I want to help you, it's only that. I'd rather die than give you pain. 
or hurt one hair on your head. Oh, dear little Miles, all I want. Please, help me to save you. A moment later, I the answer to my appeal was instantaneous. A gust of frozen air blasted the room, and the room shook as if a casement had crashed in. Dear heaven, the candle's out. I did it. I blew it out, my dear. Have you written to the master? Yes, this is the letter. I'll leave it here on the table. Luke will take it. Isn't Flora with you, Mrs. Gross? No, indeed, Miss. I thought she was with you and Master Miles in the schoolroom. She was not. Miles has been playing the piano for me. Oh, dear heaven, I see it now. Miles? Yes, my dear? Where's Flora? I thought she was with Mrs. Gross. I've no idea where she is. Sorry. Oh, she'll be in one of the rooms upstairs, Miss. No, no. Miles has played his little trick on me and it's worked. We've been caught. Flora's not in the house. She's gone out. Without a hat? Isn't that woman always without one? She's with her. Of course. She's with her. We must find them quickly. But Master Miles, where's oh, he? Oh, he's gone to Quint. But we must get to Flora before it's too late. Come on. Oh. You're making for the lake, miss. You think she's in? She may be, but I don't think so. I think she's returned to the place I told you of. The place where she encountered that vile woman. When she pretended not to see. Oh, with that astounding self-possession. I've always been sure she wanted to go back alone. And now her brother has managed it for her. You suppose the children really talk of them? If we heard the things they say, we'd be simply appalled. And if Flora is there... Then Miss Jessel is. Beyond a doubt. You'll see. Come on. I reached the lake with my friend close behind me. There was no trace of flora on either bank. But for about 20 yards on the opposite edge, a thick copse came down to the lake. No! No, wait! She's taken the boat. Then where is it? I don't see a boat. No, you don't. The strongest proof of all. She's used it to go over. And then she's hidden it. All alone? That child? But she's not alone. And at times like this, she's not a child. She's a... an old, old woman. <laughs> Look there, where the trees come down to the water. The boat could be there. But if it is, then where's Flora? That's exactly what we must find out. Come on, we must walk all the way round. It won't take us more than ten minutes. Come on, take my arm. Oh, mercy me. It oh. took us only eight minutes to find the boat, precisely where I had suspected it would be. We passed through the trees into the open, and there, a short way off, stood Flora, smiling. She waited for us, not herself taking a step. We approached, and she smiled and smiled. Oh, my darling! My darling little girl, thank heaven you're safe. What a terrible fright you've given us. You could have been drowned. Whatever made you do it? Where are your hats and coats? Where yours are, Flora, my dear. And where's Miles? I'll tell you if you'll tell me. Yes? What? Miss, please. Where, my pet, is Miss Jessel? No. Oh, no. The glare on the child's face as I broke the silence between us and uttered that name was like the smash of a pane of glass. A second later, I was seizing my colleague's arm. Look! She's there! She's there! Before us, on the opposite bank, stood Miss Jessel, exactly as she'd stood the other time. Mrs. Gross's dazed blink across to where I pointed convinced me that she, too, at last saw. My eyes moved to the child... I was shaken by her reaction. Not even deigning to glance in the direction of the prodigy I announced, she turned instead on me an expression of hard, still gravity. An expression that seemed to read and accuse and judge me. I gaped at her coolness, though I was never more sure of anything in my life than that she could see the figure. She's there, you unhappy little thing, there! There, there! 
And you know it as well as you know me. Oh, what a dreadful turn to be sure, miss. Where on earth do you see anything? There, as large as life. Hideous. Fire. Look. You don't see her as we do? You mean you don't now? Look. She's as big as a blazing fire. Only look, dear woman, look. Nothing. I see nothing. There's nothing to see. Then I'm lost. Defeated. She isn't there, my little pet. Nobody's there. And you never saw anything, my sweet. How can poor Miss Jessel, when Miss Jessel's dead and buried? We know, don't we, love? Of course we do, Mrs. Gross. It's all been a terrible mistake and a worry and a joke. Oh. And now we'll all go home as fast as we can. A joke, perhaps, and played on me. For that creature's made herself invisible to your eyes. But there she stands, a monster of evil. And you see her, Flora, don't you? As clearly as you see me. I don't know what you mean. I see nobody. I see nothing. I never have. I think you're cruel. I don't like you. Oh, Mrs. Gross, take me away. Please take me away. Take me away from her. From me. From you. From you. Oh, Flora. Oh, dear Flora, darling child. I've lost you. I can see that. I've interfered, and you've been shown by her the perfect way to counter me. I've done my best, but I've lost you. Goodbye, Flora, dear. No, go, Mrs. Gross. Go. Take the child away from here. Oh, come on, dear. <laughs> Wake up. Mm. Wake up, miss. What is it? What's happened? It's little Flora. She was very restless in the night, and now she's so agitated. She won't eat. She'll settle to nothing. She keeps <sighs> bursting into tears. I'm afraid she's going to make herself ill. Mm. And it's all about you, miss. Yes, me, of course. I'm the one who questioned her truthfulness. I certainly put my foot in it there. She'll never speak to me again. I don't think she ever will, miss. Has she said a single word to you about Miss Jessel? Not one. And of course, you know that when I took her from the lake, there was nobody there. I indeed. And nothing in the world could have been cleverer on Miss Jessel's part than to close your eyes to her presence. Flora now has her grievance, and she'll work it to the end. To what end? What Flora wants is to get rid of me. She'll make me out to her uncle to be the lowest creature in the world. She'll say she's unable. She refuses to live with me. That's what she keeps saying. She never again wants so much as to look at you. And is that what you've come for? To speed me on my way? Oh, no. I've a better way. On Sunday, I was terribly near leaving. But I've been thinking. It's you who must go. <gasps> you must take Flora away from here. Away from them. Away even most of all now from me. Take her straight to her uncle. But what on earth shall I say to him? You must say what your conscience dictates. I have held nothing back from you. I rely on your loyalty. But, Miles, do you not think he'll... Turn on me? No, I don't think he will. I honestly believe he wants to speak. Last evening he sat with me for two hours in the firelight as if the words were trembling on his lips. No. Take Flora away as soon as possible and leave me alone with him. If you say so, miss. There's one thing, of course. Before she goes, they mustn't see each other. Not even for a second. That's absolutely vital. Mrs. Gross, they haven't already. I'm not such a fool as that, miss. Whenever I've left her, one of the maids has always been with her. She's alone at present, but safely locked in. Then get her things packed and take her away. I must give Miles some more time before he sees his uncle. Then you'll be coming up to town yourself with the boy. Of course. But a day or two may really bring it out. Miles will then be on my side. And you can see the importance of that. If nothing happens, 
If Miles doesn't talk, I'll have failed. But I trust you'll have done what you can with their uncle. Your idea's the right one, miss. I'll take Flora away this very morning. In any event, I myself... Yes? I can't stay here. You mean that since yesterday you've seen? Not seen, miss. Heard. Heard? From that child. Horrors. Horrors. On my honour, miss. She says such things. Oh, dear Lord. Shocking, shocking things. And coming from those innocent lips. About me? About you, miss. Since you must have it. It's beyond everything for a child of her age. I can't think where she must have picked up, sir. I can. Oh, I can. Thank God. Thank God? This so justifies me. It does that, miss. So, in spite of yesterday, you believe? Oh, yes. I believe. And that's why I must get her away from this... from them. There's one thing, of course. My letter to their uncle. It will have reached town before you. Your letter won't have got there, miss. Your letter never went. Never went? What became of it? Goodness knows. Master Miles must have... You mean he took it? It's the only explanation. When I came back with Miss Flora yesterday, I saw it wasn't where you'd put it. I asked Luke later, and he said he'd never seen it. Mrs Gross, leave us. Leave us. I'll get it out of him. He'll confess. If he confesses, he's saved. And if he's saved... Then you are? Don't worry. I'll save you without him. When I came down to breakfast, I learned that the carriage containing Mrs. Gross and my younger pupil had already rolled out of the gates. Miles, I gathered, had breakfasted alone and had then gone out. As the time for luncheon approached, I awaited Miles in the room through whose windows that first scared Sunday I'd seen the horrendous vision of the dead Peter Quint. Ah, oh, Miles. How do you do? I say, my dear, is she really very ill? Little Flora? She'll soon be better. London will set her up. Bly had ceased to agree with her. Come here, Miles, and take your mutton. Thank you. Our meal was of the briefest, mine a vain pretense, and I had the things immediately removed. While this was done, Miles stood with his hands in his pockets and his back to me, looking out of the wide window, the window through which that Sunday I'd seen what I had seen. We continued silent while the maid was with us, as silent it whimsically occurred to me as some young couple who at the inn on their wedding journey feel shy in the presence of the waiter. It was only when she'd finally left that he turned round. So... We're alone. More or less. Not absolutely. No, there are... the others. He faced the window again and remained there a while, his forehead against the glass. At last he turned to face me. Well, I think I'm glad that Bly agrees with me. I've been freer in the last two days than ever before. Now that we're alone together... You'll be more on your own. I hope you don't mind. Oh, my dear Miles. Though I've renounced all claim to your company, I at least greatly enjoy it. What else should I stay on for? You stay on just for that? Certainly. I stay on as your friend. And from the tremendous interest I take in you, I'll stay until you're settled into something more worth your while. Don't you remember how I told you, when I came and sat on your bed, the night of the storm, that there was nothing in the world I wouldn't do for you? Yes, yes. Only that, I think, was to get me to do something for you. Yes, it was partly that. But you didn't do it, you know. Oh, yes. You wanted me to tell you something. That's it. Out. Straight out. 
What do you have on your mind, you know? Ah, then is that what you stayed over for? Well, well, yes. I may as well make a clean breast of it. It was precisely for that. Do you mean now? Here? There couldn't be a better place or time. He looked round him uneasily, and I had the strange, the rare impression of the very first approach of fear in him. It was as if he was suddenly afraid of me. Do you want to go out again very much? Awfully. Look, I'll tell you everything. I mean, I'll tell you anything you like. I will tell you. I will. But not now. Why not now? I have to see Luke. Well, then go to Luke, and I'll wait for what you promise. Only in return for that, before you leave me, please satisfy one very much smaller request. Smaller? A mere fraction of the whole. Tell me if yesterday afternoon, from the table in the hall, you took, you know, my letter. How he took this, I didn't know. For the next minute, I sprang straight up and drew him close, instinctively keeping him with his back to the window as I fell for support against the nearest piece of furniture. For the appearance was full upon us, the appearance that I had already had to deal with. Peter Quint had come into view like a sentinel before a prison. The next instant, he'd reached the window. Close to the glass, he glared in, offering once more to the room his white face of damnation. In an instant, my decision was made. Seeing and facing what I saw, I would keep the boy himself unaware. It was like fighting with a demon for a human soul. Yes, I took it. Oh, my dear boy, my dear boy. I drew him close. I held him to my breast where I could feel the sudden fever of his little body, the tremendous pulse of his little heart. And all the while I kept my eyes on the thing at the window. I saw it move and its slow wheel was like the prowl of a baffled beast. Oh, why did you take it? To see what you said about me. You opened it. I held him off a little and saw how completely ravaged he was. But what did the strain matter when my eyes went back to the window and I saw that the air was clear again? I had quenched the influence. It was my personal triumph. And you found nothing? No, you said very little. You asked my uncle to come down. So what have you done with it? I've burnt it. Burnt it? Is that what you did at school? Take letters, or, or other things. Other things? Did I steal? Is that what you mean? Oh, I don't know what I mean. I don't know why you were expelled from your school. Oh, so you knew that I mightn't go back? I knew. Well, did you? No, I didn't steal. Well, then what did you do? I... I... Well... I said things. But to whom did you say these terrible things? These things worthy of the severest punishment? No, oh, I don't know. I can't remember their names. Oh, was it just so many then? No, only a few. Those I liked. Those I liked. I seemed to float, not into clarity, but a darker obscure. A second later, out of my pity, I was seized with the appalling alarm that he might perhaps be innocent. The thought was for an instant confounding and bottomless, for if he were innocent, then what on earth was I? Paralysed while it lasted by the implications of the question, I let him go a little so that, with a deep, drawn sigh, he turned away from me again and faced the clear window. And did they repeat what you said? Oh yes, they must have repeated them, to those they liked. And these things came round? To the masters, yes. But I didn't know they'd tell you. Uh, but they haven't. They didn't. That's why I'm asking you. Yes, I suppose it was too bad to put in writing. Oh, stubborn nonsense. What were those things? I must have sounded stern, though my sternness was all for his judge, his executioner. Yet it made him avert himself again, and that movement made me, with a single bound and an irrepressible cry, spring straight upon him. 
for there, against the glass, as if to blight his confession and stay his answer, was the hideous author of our woe, the white face of damnation. No more, no more. Leave us alone. Come here, my darling. Don't look. Is she here? Where? Where is she? Out of the window. She? Miss Jessel. Miss Jessel! It's not Miss Jessel, but it's at the window straight there before us. Look! There! There, there, for the last time! He was at me in a white rage, bewildered, glaring vainly over the place and missing the presence wholly, though to my sense it now filled the room, wide, overwhelming like the taste of poison. Who? Who is it? Is it him? Who do you mean by him? Peter Quint. You devil! Where? His words are in my ears still. His supreme surrender of the name, his tribute to my devotion. <laughs> what does he matter now, my own? What will he ever matter? I have you and he has lost you forever. <laughs> But he'd already jerked straight round, stared, and seen but the quiet day. With the stroke of the loss I was so proud of, he uttered the cry of a creature hurled over an abyss. As if catching him in this fall, I grasped him. Yes, I held him, it may be imagined, with what a passion. But at the end of a minute, I began to feel what it truly was that I held. We were alone with the quiet day, and his little heart, dispossessed, had stopped. In The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, the governess was played by Cathy Sarah, Mrs. Gross by Tina Gray, Miles by Joseph Tremaine, and Flora by Lulu Popplewell. Robert Lister was Douglas, Ian Brooker, Griffin, and Jonathan Keeble, Sir George. The Turn of the Screw was dramatised by Neville Teller and directed in Birmingham by Peter Leslie Wilde.